I'm very grateful for that invitation, once again, um, to speak to this conference, um, having spoken again last year. And uh, this is the third UK-China um, Trade and Investment Conference, and it's very good uh, to see the enthusiasm from both sides for increasing that trade and investment uh, relationship, despite the uncertain times that we live in, or perhaps indeed the enthusiasm because of the uncertain times in which we live. Um, as I said to you last year, I am not an expert in uh, China or UK-China uh, relations, uh, so it is perhaps fortunate that I've been asked to talk uh, just about the background of um, Brexit and the Brexit negotiations and their implications for uh, UK-China trade. So. I will try and give you some pointers as to where we, the UK and the EU, are in the whole Brexit process to suggest some ways in which Brexit will or perhaps will not uh, affect trade and investment uh, between the UK and China, um, and to suggest some ways in which you might address the uncertainties which Brexit produces. However, I will leave it to you, who are the experts uh, in this field, to know how what I say applies to your particular business niche or uh, business um, opportunity. Um, first, if I may, though, a, just a quick word about um, uh, the Ambassador Partnership. Nadia mentioned that I am uh, co-chairman of the Ambassador Partnership. Uh, just to let you know what we are, we are a consultancy consisting of an extensive network of ex-ambassadors, both British and non-British, with links to a huge number of businesses in this country and abroad. Uh, we do what we call corporate diplomacy. Uh, that is intermediating between people like yourselves, between companies like yours, and foreign governments or public sector bodies. And the key thing is that we do not just provide advice, we do do that, but we actually go out and do the diplomacy, do the negotiation um, for you on the ground. We also work on behalf of foreign businesses, including Chinese businesses uh, in the UK, those wanting to establish themselves here uh, or to understand, just to understand what is going on um, in this country. And for this purpose, we are registered uh, lobbyists with the British government. Uh, and finally, we provide high-level training for major international agencies and uh, foreign governments in leadership, um, negotiation, and associated skills. So that's the commercial. That's the uh, little bit about us and uh, what we do. Um, let me turn briefly to Brexit. Perhaps not so briefly, but to Brexit. Um, when I spoke to your conference a year ago, uh, the country, the UK, um, was still reeling, if I can put it that way, from the results of the uh, EU referendum uh, in the UK. Mrs May had the Prime Minister had just made her Lancaster House speech, setting out some red lines uh, for Brexit, namely control of immigration uh, and continuing, no continuing jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, and hence uh, the consequences which were no continuing membership of the single market and no full, whatever that might mean, full membership of the existing EU Customs Union. We're now one year on from that, and we're not much further advanced in finding out exactly what that really means. Um, as those of you who follow these uh, businesses, this business and this, these acronyms will know, um, the UK triggered the so-called Article 50 negotiation process in late March last year. Negotiations with the EU finally got underway soon after, 
but actually made little progress uh, until December last year, just a month or so ago, when the government, frankly with its back to the wall, was forced to concede a large divorce payment to the EU to settle its existing obligations, uh, to accept some continuing jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice in the UK, at least as far as EU residents in the United Kingdom are concerned in the future, and to agree some frankly fudged wording uh, which just put off the need to reconcile the absence of a hard border on the island of Ireland with leaving the single market and the customs union. And following British talk of a, quote, lengthy implementation phase after March 2019, the Commission have actually made it clear that what is on offer then, that is after March 2019, the date for the United Kingdom to leave the EU, what is on offer is continuing membership of the single market and the customs union with the obligations these memberships bring until the end of 2020. And then what is colloquially known as a cliff edge, in other words, a dramatic transition thereafter uh, to whatever has been negotiated in the meanwhile um, as our long-term relationship between the UK and the remaining European Union. So that is where we are at the moment. These so-called transitional arrangements will be under negotiation from next month. And the form of our long-term relationship with the European Union, but not the detail of that relationship, will be under negotiation from about June this year, with the Commission intending to wrap up negotiations by October this year. Let us remind ourselves that is just nine months' time to allow time for ratification of that agreement by the 27 countries remaining in the EU. <coughs> to say the least, and uh, briefly, that is extraordinary ambitious and may well not be um, achieved. But I think what matters for us today is to think a little bit about the likely long-term relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union and the implications of this long-term relationship for trade and investment between the UK and China. However, that's quite difficult to foresee at the moment, that long-term relationship, because there is still no clarity from the British government over what long-term relationship they envisage with the United Kingdom, and therefore what would the implications be for trade with third countries like China. Indeed, it's quite mind-boggling that the British cabinet had not even discussed the form of the long-term relationship they wanted with the EU until just before Christmas, about six weeks ago. And the reason, of course, is their very divergent views within the government on this issue, which have been evident uh, within the last few days, including the papers this morning, um, with different members of the government having different views about what the eventual outcome of these negotiations should be. So there is not a huge amount of clarity yet on that substance, that very important substance of what the future relationship will be. But where things are clear, unfortunately, is the situation, if you like, in negotiating terms between the two sides. And this has become increasingly clear as the negotiations have unfolded over the last year. And sad to say, uh, from this point of view, the British government have been playing a very weak hand in those negotiations very badly. And the EU, in very typical fashion, has been playing a very dominating hand, 
very ruthlessly. And there is no reason to expect, frankly, either of those negotiating hands to differ very much, or the way they're played, to differ hugely over the next year. And the second thing which has become clear in the negotiating process is that this whole negotiation is not a positive sum game in the negotiating jargon. It is actually a negative sum game. What does that mean? It means that any outcome is worse for both sides than the existing status quo. What does that mean in negotiating terms? It means that the negotiation is not so much about balancing the mutual advantage each side will get from this negotiation, which will both be an improvement on the existing. It's not about that. What it's actually about is each side trying to reduce the disadvantage they will get at the end of these negotiations. And unfortunately, in those negotiations, the UK has not only a weaker hand, it has much more to lose than the EU. So it's difficult um, to foresee what will happen in those negotiations, but it's also quite difficult be, to be very optimistic about their outcome. So where is this all likely to end up? An optimist uh, would say that there will come a crunch in these negotiations in the last quarter of 2018, a crunch during which the EU will finally see sense and agree to Mrs May's so-called far-reaching free trade agreement between the UK and the EU. Uh, a far-reaching agreement which includes services as well as goods and includes a mutual recognition of standards. In other words, what David Davis, the Brexit minister, keeps on calling Canada plus, 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 without being very specific about what those pluses mean. An optimist would say that with this, the so-called Irish problem will somehow disappear and that no one will notice uh, the £40 billion pounds odd which the British government uh, has agreed to pay to the EU over a number of years. That, I think, is what an optimist would say at this stage. Unfortunately, uh, the EU, in particular the Commission, have made it clear that this optimistic scenario is not an option. Uh, for them, it's either Canada or Norway in their terms not so-called cherry-picking between the two. And there has to be for them, and for the Irish in particular, regulatory equivalents across the Irish border. So a realist might conclude that the only possible outcome is what one might call a Norway plus solution. That is, continued membership of the single market but from outside the EU, as Norway has, plus continued membership of the customs union, which Norway does not have, to avoid a harsh, hard Irish border, and some continued payments to the EU for the privilege of remaining in these two institutions, plus some continued jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice in these areas. That's what an optimist might think the outcome uh, would look like. The problem with this outcome, though, is that it breaks all of Mrs May's red lines, which she set out exactly a year ago. Uh, it means continued membership of the single market, continued membership of the customs union, and some continued jurisdiction of the ECJ. So how will that turn out? Well, one gets into the politics of the British government. Mrs May is a pragmatist, so she may well decide that she would like to move into some kind of solution like that as the only possible outcome. Others in her government 
might prefer to see the UK crash out of the European Union with no agreement rather than agree to a solution like that. So, and this is the important point, I think, for those of you looking at it, we have to factor in to our consideration the possibility that this British government will fall apart and fall over this issue this autumn. So, the October, November, December of this year, who knows? We have to factor that in to our calculations. If that happened, uh, it would be followed by a couple of months of choosing a new leader of the Conservative Party, be followed possibly indeed by another general election, and the outcome of this could well be either inconclusive or a Labour government uh, who also do not have a very clear policy about the EU and these Brexit negotiations. So perhaps the best that one can say is that either of these outcomes, um, an inconclusive general election or a Labour government, would at least throw the negotiations with the EU into a certain amount of chaos and leading to delays and indeed very unpredictable results of those uh, negotiations. So I'm sorry to leave you with uh, a picture like that, which is not very clear. I don't think it is possible to be clear at this moment about what is going to happen. What brief conclusions can we draw from that about uh, UK trade and investment, UK-China trade and investment? First of all, we have to ask ourselves, how much does any of this actually matter, this Brexit business, how much of that does it matter to UK trade and investment with China? The answer which I'd give is that in some cases, in some areas, it matters a lot, and in others, very little. And I will try and just flesh that out a little bit. However, I think the most important thing, probably, is the continuing uncertainty about the final outcome, which actually will be unsettling, at the least, for all those involved. As I say, the final outcome will matter for some Chinese investors in the UK, but not for all. Large investments in infrastructure, for instance, will be more affected by the general economic climate in this country and the prognosis for the British economy than by trade issues. On the other hand, other Chinese investments in this country, particularly those in manufacturing and services, may depend deeply on supply chains and markets in the rest of the EU and on access for people to the United Kingdom. And these, in turn, will depend on whether the UK remains in the single market, uh, plus, of course, how we manage our immigration system um, in the future. And one mustn't forget uh, that a potential future UK-China trade and investment um, agreement uh, may well be important, but is unlikely to be defined for several years. What does that also mean? Well, once the UK has left the EU, the UK will lose any potential benefits of the UK-China investment protection agreement, which has been under negotiation for a number of years, but has not yet come to a conclusion. And the UK would not benefit from any future EU-China free trade agreement. Now, my understanding is that since there exist already uh, UK-Hong Kong and UK-China um, investment treaties, that there is not much to be lost, uh, not much to be gained for the UK by being part of an EU-China investment treaty, and not much to be lost, therefore, by not being uh, part of that treaty once we leave. On the other hand, there would be a lot to be gained uh, were we still members of the EU by an EU-China free trade agreement, although that is probably some way down the track. The chances of an alternative UK-China free trade agreement being negotiated in short term seem to me rather slim. Um, 
for, I think, three reasons. Firstly, because the UK on its own will not have the heft uh, of the EU to negotiate an advantageous treaty. Uh, secondly, because China may well prefer to prioritize a free trade agreement and the negotiations with the EU rather than with the UK on its own. And thirdly, because the policy of the Department of International Trade seems to be to prioritize free trade agreements between the UK and countries with whom the EU already has free trade agreements, and beyond that with the so-called easy countries as far as FTAs are concerned, namely the US, Australia, etc. Negotiating a free trade agreement between the UK and China will, I think, come some way down the list. So, wrapping up. So, my analysis is that not much will change on the UK to China trade and investment front after Brexit, at least in the short term, except that the UK will be have, to, have to be careful about the implications of its visa policy and wary about slipping behind in terms of regulation and in terms of reduced weight in trade relations. Other factors which you will know about are likely to be more important than Brexit, at least in the next few years. So in conclusion, I have three suggestions for those for you in, involved in this. Briefly, do not be passive in this process. You have interests in how these negotiations with the UK and the EU turn out. Do not be passive about it. Lobby either through your, on your own or through trade associations to get the kind of outcomes which you would like. Do not let UK politicians be focused entirely on the politics of Brexit, including the domestic politics of Brexit, rather than the economic and trade consequences. Secondly, do not wait for the fog of Brexit to clear. That will take some time. If there are potentially good trade and investment opportunities, go for it. But be aware of the implications of Brexit. Add Brexit to your risk register, um, and including the uncertainties. And finally, try to remain flexible. We live in an extraordinarily complex and changing world which is not predictable. So flexibility is actually a great advantage for all companies in being able to adjust to whatever happens in the future. Right. The chairman is quite rightly telling me to stop. I will stop. Uh, I will leave you for the rest of your day to focus on the important issues in UK-China trade, of which Brexit may be only a small part. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nari. So